Every location here in America has something that get, makes it special, that gives it meaning. Now here in the Blackstone River Valley, what is special, what gives it meaning, its defining characteristic is the river. It's given us our history, it's helped shape our cultures. Through its tremendous water power, it's given us our industrial landscape. Its many ponds and tributaries has given us land suitable for farming. For over 200 years, the river has acted as a catalyst for entrepreneurial businesses, for major industries, and for waves of immigrants who found their way to the Blackstone Valley for work. And as we sit here in the quiet waters of Salisbury Pond in downtown Worcester, with a major mill behind us, you get a sense of feeling just how important this river has been to the entire region. They call it the hardest working river in America, and with good reason. And yet, if you ask the question, where did all the toxic waste, where did all the dyes go? The answer is right into that hard working river. And today, as we sit here 25 years after the Clean Water Act, and 25 years after we've been environmentally aware, the question we're pursuing is, What's the health of the Blackstone River? How's it doing? Is the cleanup efforts really making a difference? Well, to answer that, we're gonna track down some very interesting folks who are seeking that answer. So listen, folks, let's grab our paddles and let's head out to discover water quality on the Blackstone River. When examining water quality, generally we attack it from a scientific approach. But that's not the only approach, and certainly one we're going to take a look at today is a little different. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at some of the myths of the Blackstone River from a water quality perspective, and we're also going to take a hands-on approach to just how clean the water is today. So let's travel down to Central Falls and catch up with some very interesting way to look at water quality. Allison lived in a house in a town that had long ago turned its back on the river. It thought that the Blackstone was just filled with garbage and with the smells of everything no one wanted. Allison's own house, in fact, in a small group of other homes looking just like hers, had only one small window in the kitchen from which Allison could see the river. A heavy and high metal wire fence separated the group of houses from the Blackstone's banks. Just the same, though. Allison loved to climb the fence and go down to the river. Her parents wondered why she would, saying that the river could offer her nothing but trouble. They said that if, heaven forbid, she would fall in, she would be taken up by the currents and fed into an old mill and be turned into cotton cloth. Now we're going to talk about water quality, but we're going to talk about water quality with storytellers. Because there's lots of ways to tell the story of the Blackstone River and tell it from a different vantage point. We're fortunate enough to sneak in off the street here in Central Falls, Rhode Island with Mark Levitt and Mary Lee Partington. Mark Levitt is a noted storyteller, and Mary Lee Partington is one of the creative geniuses behind Pendragon. And we're talking about water quality because we're talking about Allison and the Blackstone. That's right. Now, how did the story come together? Well, if, as I recall, we were sitting having a conversation one evening at Cov down in Providence, and uh, we got to talking about growing up uh, here in Rhode Island and especially along the banks of the Blackstone River. And Mark has composed stories for years and traveled throughout the country, and uh, I think it interested him, uh, the perspectives about uh, growing up in a, in a place that was ru rural, but at the same time urban and had a tremendous uh, legacy of, of, of textile history and, uh, and a river that has a tremendous story to tell as well. What it is, basically, was a, is a story about a little girl who lives along the Blackstone River and a story about her being taken back into Native American times, at the, uh, the pre-colonial contact times, and given a gift to bring back to modern times. And in the process, she goes through the different stages of the river's history, from pre-colonial to colonial to uh, uh, the early stages of the, American Revo the Industrial Revolution to uh, the canal along the river, to the train, to the bus, and then back into the present. And the gift that she's bringing to present-day America is what? Well, the specific gift is a gift of pure water 
that existed in the river, which is so surprising to her growing up in contemporary uh, Rhode Island, contemporary New England, not realizing that a river could indeed be pure enough to drink. And uh, she's given this water almost as a reminder to people of what's possible with the arteries, the water arteries that run through our, uh, our, our, uh, our Mother Earth in this area. And so the quality of the water that she gets illuminates the landscape from where she lives when she finally is able to open it up. Allison saw what she thought was a bear, and she turned to ask the Nipmuc woman if it was. But the medicine woman's hands were filled with river water that she was about to drink. Don't do that, Allison shouted. Y your hand will lose its skin, and you'll die from the water. This water is pure, said the woman. It's the blood of Mother Earth, and we keep it clean. Allison looked at the river and realized she could see all the way to the bottom. The water was perfectly clear, and there were fish, thousands of them. Allison drank the water, and it was sweet. Well, you know, in, in growing up here, I think one of the, the stories that captured you was this whole idea of our awareness that the river had been so sullied by industrial processes over two centuries that it, when we were kids, we thought that if we were to put our, our hand into the water, mm -hmm. that it would come out nothing but bones. <laughs> which is a line that we actually use yeah. in the piece, which fascinated me because the perception of the river's cleanliness and the way that people related to the river were so interconnected. And now that there is some recognition of the vitality and the importance of having a river running through this area, hopefully pieces like this work, like the Heritage Carter, will change the relationship that people have in the, the valley itself. And when Billy said that his parents once saw a kid stick his hand into the river and it came out looking like a skeleton. No skin, no muscle, just bone. I think that's part of the story we in the, the Park Service here in the Heritage Quarter are trying to tell along with you folks, along with many other people in the Valley, the fact that this is a special place and deserves the pride we have for it and deserves our efforts to help clean it up. Fantastic. I know cities all over the country that would just love to have this resource in their backyard. I mean, I can be working in my office uh, 5 o'clock, drive here in 15 minutes, put my boat on, paddle five minutes up from here, and be like I'm in the wilderness in Canada. Uh, there's so many geese and other wildlife up here that are nesting right now. It's just a fantastic resource. You should at least take a basic canoeing class so that you know what would happen if you tipped over while you were up there, uh, to watch out think, for things of the elements like hypothermia or coldness, uh, and also just how to stop your boat so you can get out to portage around the dam. I would just think if I knew that this was here, I'd be here. Uh, and I think if you could just let people know that they can come put a boat in here and wear their life jackets and uh, get a little canoe training, go up and be in the middle of nature uh, in five minutes, uh, I think you'd have a lot of people wanting to do that. Enjoying this gorgeous weather, we're with uh, Joe Bear. And Joe, you have one of those unique companies that a lot of people die for. <laughs> it's a paddling company. You sell all kinds of canoes and kayaks and boats. That's cool. And you just changed location to come up here into the Blackstone yes. Valley. Why'd you do that? Well, uh, really a confluence of reasons. One, from a commercial standpoint, the proximity to a greater population. But from a, um, from a river vantage point, what, what we're increasingly seeing is a, a real interest in urban paddling. More, that is, paddling is more often associated with rural, pristine, very traditional, sort of far away settings. But, but increasingly people are using canoes and kayaks and other small boats to, to get on the water for an hour after work, an hour before work, and whatever. And uh, rivers such as the Blackstone and some of the others around here are, are offering an opportunity, I think, for people for an hour, just for an hour after work. It's in your backyard, and it's been overlooked for years, I think. Um, 
the, you know, the history new, and that I'm new to the area. I'm still learning from people like yourself and, and uh, you know, and others. But in the brief, you know, my brief time up here since we moved last November, moved our business to this area, I've been really struck by the by the history. I mean, it really it is a treasure that, that a lot of people that live here are just now learning about, and a lot of people that we know from outside this area are very surprised to find uh, find out about. And I think. The Blackstone offers a really nice mix of architecture, history, ecological concerns, as well as just fun recreational opportunities. I mean, it really draws all those things together um, in a way that is, is pretty unique. Well, I, I think paddling, along with other forms of outdoor recreation, uh, what we try to do, I think, is help create a constituency for the river and the waterway. And it really, in, in some ways, comes down to the what's in it for me, what do I get out of it factor. So if we can say to people, if we can say to people, look, if the river's cleaner, you'll have more fun. Your kids can swim in it, you can fish in it and eat what you catch, you can paddle in it without odor, then you're creating a constituency, a, a, somebody that cares about the waterway. And by, by using paddling, if you will, to, to uh, demonstrate you know, to the general public the value of the waterway, then you'll help to clean it up. So. Oh. What condition is the Blackstone River really in? Well, thanks to an innovative program sponsored by the Mass Audubon Society, in partnership with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, the divisions of fish and wildlife for both Massachusetts and Rhode Island, a slew of other federal and state agencies, and most importantly, high school students in the Blackstone Valley on both the Massachusetts side of the line and the Rhode Island side, we have a pretty good handle on what the river looks like today. But how does this water quality testing program really work? Well, let's catch up with the students on the river and find out. I'm putting the pH into the water. We're checking the pH of the water. We gotta put six drops of this stuff. Okay. Let me see. This is for the dissolved oxygen test. And now I'm waiting until it settles into the halfway mark. Then I'm gonna put in number three. And then I'm gonna shake it up. Using the millipore paddles, pour your water sample up to the line in a plastic yeah. cover. Up to the line. Yeah. Now ladies, what are you doing there? Testing for fecal coliform. <laughs> so we're gonna put this water in with this, uh, I don't know, is it a colony of bacteria? And see how well the bacteria grows well, in it. No, it's like a thing, it's a growing place for the fecal matter. <laughs> So the fecal matter grows. It's gotta, it's gotta, it's gotta incubate sit. for 24 hours. Like it. <laughs> what we're doing is taking the samples of different areas of the river, like um, right here, taking samples of organic stuff. Out there in the middle, there's like somewhat of a bar. It's not up to the surface, but just a lot of gravel up there. So what we're doing is collecting a specific area of one, about one foot. And then when we go back to school, we're going to see what kind of organisms we can find in it. And so a lot of what the organisms we find will tell us what shape the river is in. Um, in the past few times, what we found is a lot of stuff that has, hasn't been very good. It's been stuff that's very characteristic of a river that's uh, quite polluted. Um, there's different classes of organisms. And of the ones that are not too tolerant to pollution, there are none. The only ones we find are the ones that are extremely tolerant. So. Testing the water. Gathering all this data is one thing. Trying to figure out what it all means is quite another. 
So let's catch up with Alan Cooperman, who's an environmental engineer for the Division of Environmental Analysis for the state of Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, and find out just how healthy the Blackstone River really is. Well, as we're standing beside the river, there is absolutely no odor. If you were here 25 years ago, it would smell like a primary or secondary sewage treatment plant, or worse, uh, the basic uh, problems with the river were there was little or no treatment in uh, the early 60s. When you uh, got involved with the Blackstone River in the upper watershed, you ended up with uh, a whole bunch of industry just dumping raw sewage or partially treated sewage into the river. And uh, because of the lack of treatment, the odor was awful. More, uh, more than that, there was very little wildlife. Uh, the river was had, had no fish. It was just putrid. Things have changed dramatically in a, in a period of time with the creation of the Upper Blackstone Wastewater Treatment Plant and the Millbury Treatment Plant above where we're standing. Things have changed completely. I saw an article and it said that the Blackstone River was a polluted river and probably it was meant to be that way. Uh, people just didn't care. Uh, a river was polluted, so be it. It was a means of getting rid of their waste as long as it uh, didn't affect the, them in particular. They didn't use the river for swimming. They didn't use the river for drinking. So it was a la lack of caring. People just didn't care about the water. So in uh, at least the 25 years since you've been working on the river, it really has changed a lot, hasn't it? Oh, it dramatically changed. This river has fish in it. Uh, we just finished a fish survey and actually found a rainbow trout in uh, Fisherville Pond. Uh, that, that in itself is a miracle. Uh, I would have never expected to find fish in here. In, in the early days, there wasn't any oxygen, and fish can't survive in the lack of oxygen. Just, there was no oxygen in the river. Well, the, uh, the state, in conjunction with uh, EPA and the uh, University of Rhode Island, have just completed a wet weather study. Uh, and we see that uh, the river does have major problems under wet weather conditions. Uh, a lot of the sewers in Worcester are combined sewer system and uh, stormwater and, and sewage combine and discharge into the river under certain kinds of conditions. And uh, under wet weather, you do have a lot of solids, you still have a lot of bacteria. There are still problems. Uh, we call them non-point source problems, and there are still those kind of problems that exist. And uh, that's what the future holds. We have to work on those things. Things that I'm concerned about are uh, the things it took us an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money to get to where we are now. And uh, I wouldn't want to see us uh, digress, go backwards. Uh, this would be an awful situation if we don't pay attention to what we have now and work towards a, a better future. We'll be back to the conditions that existed in the early 60s. Just where does 200 years of toxic material go to that's been generated by the great industrialization of the Blackstone Valley? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? And one we should probably know the answer to. So let's track down Ranger Dick Cleaver and learn a little bit about sediment. We're standing on the sediments behind the Rockdale Dam. The Rockdale Dam was one of, well, at one time there were 45 dams along the river. The river's only 45 miles long. That's a dam every mile. Anyway, there are only 18 of them left. The Rockdale Dam, as a matter of fact, went out in 1969. And then they decided to remove the entire dam. And of course, this is what's left, the sediments behind the dams. And mixed in with all of these sediments are all kinds of particles. There could be PCBs, there could be heavy metals. You name it, they're all here. You know, if you look at these sediments, they're extremely fine. No gravel or anything else. This is as the, this whole area was a lake. The dirty water with a lot of sediments in it 
came down and slowed down and these all dropped out. And that's what's causing the real problem. Now people say, well, why can't you get in there and scoop it up or dredge it up? Okay, now what do we do with it? Dump it over here and make a new toxic waste dump? No, the best thing to do is to leave it here. Rebuild the dams, take care of the dams so they don't wash out. So here in the sediments of the hardest working river in the country, the old Blackstone River, there's quite a story to be told. And someday we'll get it all cleaned up. This is Dick Kleber, Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. See you, see you in the valley. We sit on the calm waters of Narragansett Bay, about four miles south of the city of Providence, Rhode Island, the state capital. We're here with Fred Massey, who's Director of Communications and Education, to complete our story about water quality. Because, Fred, there's no better place to talk about water quality than Narragansett Bay, is there? Well, this is a, uh, Narragansett Bay is a designated estuary of natural, national significance. It's a place where fresh water and salt water meet and mix, and estuaries are among the most biologically productive places on Earth. They surpass even rainforests in terms of biological no productivity. This estuary, Narragansett Bay, sustains and embraces over 40,000 different species. It's a spawning ground, a nursery, a habitat for things like oysters, seals, winter flounder, comorants, uh, and people. People are, are part of that ecosystem. And that ecosystem is, is sustains us uh, both in terms of recreational opportunities, getting out on the bay and enjoying it, swimming, diving, sailing. It also is an economic resource. It's, a, it's the engine, the heart, really, of our region's economy. People come here to this area um, to work and play on the bay. Other businesses also are drawn to this area because of our quality of life. And that quality of life is largely defined by the fact that we live on an estuary, a place where fresh water and salt water meet and mix. The Blackstone is a major influence to Narragansett Bay. It's vital to the survival of Narragansett Bay as an estuary. And the health of the Blackstone affects Narragansett Bay. Conversely, the health of Narragansett Bay affects the quality of life in the Blackstone and beyond. In our vision, Narragansett Bay, the rivers that feed the bay, are places where people will be able to go and safely swim and fish without fear of infection or disease. It's a place where individuals can, can collect paw hogs, uh, scallops, fish for an evening's meal and not worry about the fact that they might be contaminated with pollution. During the Native American times, that's what Narragansett Bay was. It was a terrific resource, a recreational and commercial resource. Uh, over the course of time, people have had a, a disastrous impact on Narragansett Bay. But the good news is, while we have the, the potential to harm the bay, we also have the power to heal it. And this is really what Save the Bay is about. Um, the, the use of the bay uh, ranges from uh, shipping that comes from all over the world to the individual who goes by the side of the shore and casts a line in for a striped bass. That mixed use of the bay is important. The nature of our relationship to this ecosystem is not to put a glass bubble over it and to prevent people from using it. We are part of the ecosystem. And so the sustainability of this bay, of our rivers, um, of our environment in general, depends on our understanding how the system works and how what role we play in that. When Save the Bay started, um, it was a, a conjunction of the planets. The age of Aquarius was born in 1970. Save the Bay was formed by a handful of people who were sick to death of looking out at a bay that was becoming increasingly polluted and developed. At the same time, the United States Environmental Protection Agency that same year was born and the nation celebrated its first Earth Day. I think there was a sense not only in Narragansett Bay but throughout the nation and, and I believe throughout the world that our environment 
had been abused for long enough and it was now time for us to turn the tide to start looking at what we needed to do to make this a cleaner healthier place what we've seen over that that course of those 25 years is an amazing turnaround in the, the quality of the water in Narragansett Bay the pipe sources that were spewing poisons into the bay have been addressed. The passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972 gave an enormously important lever to groups like Save the Bay. Over the course of time, though, we've been working more and more on the process of education, on working together with people. Um, things had reached such a turn in the 70s that there was a need for finger pointing and uh, table thumping to stop the damage that was occurring. That process served its purpose, but those days are gone. There's, and, and in fact, it created a great deal of divisiveness. Environment and economy were seen as two opposing forces banging heads more often than not. Over the past really 10 years or so, there's been an enormous change in the, whole, in the face of environmental protection. Environmentalists have recognized that, that, that it, the, the term environmentalist is not what one group is, but right. we are all environmentalists, and we are all economists as well. We're all people who are involved in both our environment and our economy. So there's been a movement together. How can we sustain a healthy economy and at the same time sustain a healthy environment? Now, however, what this bay is, is suffering from, 50% of the pollution by some estimates, is runoff, stormwater runoff from the land. And that's a, that's a problem that's much more difficult to, to address. It's easier to point at a pipe and say that's the problem than to, to look at the roads and the highways, the failing septic systems that bubble up sewage and that pollution is washed off the roads and the highways. Our cars spewing poisons onto the roads. People look at the rain as a cleansing um, occurrence and it is a cleansing occurrence but all of that dirt has to go somewhere. You know, It's like taking a shower. You're clean but the dirt goes down. What we're, we're working on now is helping people to understand the, the effect of individual behavior on the, the ecosystem. How when a failing septic system is not just a wet, smelly spot in the back of your yard, but in fact affects all of the, your surrounding environment. It affects your neighbors, it affects your local water supply, and ultimately affects the rivers and the bay. The goal of the Federal Clean Water Act was to make all waters fishable and swimmable. That's the goal of Save the Bay, and it's a goal that I haven't found anybody who lives in this region willing to argue with. What a great way to end the show. Great day on the water here in Narragansett Bay in Providence, Rhode Island. You know, we really have come a long way from the Blackstone River in Worcester. And along that journey, we've learned a lot. We've learned that we all live downstream from someone, and therefore, our actions and our behaviors really affect other people. We ought to think about it. And secondly, you know, the Clean Water Act really works. In 1972, when they informed some of the early beginnings of environmental law, there are Vision really helped because the water is measurably cleaner now, thanks to the Clean Water Act. And finally, you know, paddling with the family on the Blackstone and Narragansett Bay and some of the tributaries of the Blackstone can be an awful lot of fun and great recreation. So folks, this is Chuck Arning, park ranger of the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, saying, you know, why don't you grab a paddle and join me on the river? We'll see you next time.